everyone. Uh, we are about to start our next talk uh, for the uh, UK Government Disability Network, um, which is um, the talk will be presented by Mary Dunn, who is a professor of evaluation in economics in the School of International Development at the UEA Knowledge UK. Marin's work is focused on applied microeconometrics, impact relations, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, as well as digital financial inclusion and replication and reproduction of quant analysis. Marin has worked with the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, D.C. and the Overseas Development Institute in London. She holds a PhD in development economics from the UEA. Uh, she's the author of a range of peer-reviewed academic publications and several Campbell systematic reviews on financial inclusion, payments for results, child immunization, and uh, the link between government policies and income inequalities. So before I give the floor to Marin, I would like to apologize that for some reason you're not seeing me. <laughs> it's a technical issue, so please accept my apologies. I'm I'm stopping sharing uh, the introductory slides so that Mari could share her own slides. Just to remind that we are going to uh, record, we are already recording the session. We will be sharing it uh, later on our YouTube channel. I will also provide a link to our Twitter account uh, so that you can follow us for more updates and uh, on, on forthcoming events. So, uh, without much ado, I'll ask Marin um, uh, to talk about her perspective uh, on replication and credibility in economics. Great. Um, thank you very much, Shafak. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation and possibly see me somewhere in the corner of your teams as well. Uh, it seems teams is a little bit temperamental today, but I hope it's going to work out. Um, so today, um, well, it's a, it's a pleasure really to be here today uh, to talk about replication and the credibility of research, research um, seen from an economist perspective. So I'm an economist by training. Um, so and I thought it'd be useful uh, maybe to uh, give my perspective of where we are in terms of replication and credibility of research uh, in the economic sphere. Um, so there have been a lot of uh, studies more recently that have shown that only 10% of published science articles are reproducible. And this figure is a bit of a wake up call and may explain why this is a topic that has been increasingly debated uh, in recent years, especially in the medical sciences, psychology, and also the political sciences, but economists have been unusually quiet uh, to join into this debate, um, raising the question as to why is it that economists are so reluctant uh, to talk about um, replication, maybe suggesting that economists have an uncomfortable relationship with some of the aspects of the scientific research process. And this is in fact summed up very nicely uh, on the next slide. So the next slide, um, well, you see the uh, cartoon um, from Bart Simpson here, uh, looking very unhappy. Um, and this quote is actually um, from O'Brien um, as a response to the Rogoff and Reinhardt case. So O'Brien wrote in the Atlantic magazine that for an economist, the five most terrifying words in the English language are, I can't replicate your results. So, and maybe as a reminder um, to those of you who are not familiar with the Rogoff and Reinhardt case. So these are both economists at Harvard University, and they assembled an exhaustive uh, list of macroeconomic statistics for countries around the world to explore the financial consequences of accrued government expenditure over time. So they basically find that advanced economies, uh, largely US and Western Europe, for which central government debt is at least 90% of GDP experience economic contractions. So this finding of this research um, took off, forming the foundation for uh, austerity measures that many governments in Western Europe and the United States um, have adopted. So really quite a very influential um, piece of work. However, there has been a grad student at the University of Mass Amherst in the US uh, who attempted to replicate Rogos and Reinhardt's work and the process uncovered a slew of errors in the academic workflow in Microsoft Excel. I mean, first of all, I was surprised these top researchers 
we're using Microsoft Excel, but never mind that. Um, so basically, this grad student um, uncovered uh, many Microsoft Excel errors that snowballed and led governments to adopt these austerity measures on the basis of really flawed analysis. And as we know, austerity measures had a lot of dire consequences um, for many advanced um, economies, and um, we're still feeling this today. So in a nutshell, careless work has consequences, and, and hence it's, it's really incredibly important uh, to make data and code available, allowing the replication of published work for the sake of transparency and also for um, audit purposes. So what I'm trying to do in my talk today is to provide some pointers um, as to why replication may be so terrifying to economists and what we can do to institutionalize replication in the economics profession. So first, we need to better understand what we mean by replication, especially in the context of economics, how economists engage in the scientific process and what the challenges to replication are and why so few replications have actually been published in economics so far. So I'm trying to all of these points uh, slowly, slowly uh, in my subsequent slides. So let me start off with asking what is replication? Um, and I'm taking very much an economics perspective here because I know the term replication has different meanings and possibly different disciplines. And it's not always the term replication that is being used, but also reproducibility, robustness checking, and so on. So again, focusing on economics, there's no consensus in the economics literature on how we should be defining replication. So there have been, of course, various papers trying to grapple with this uh, issue of defining replication. So for example, we have a study by Pesarin published in 2003, who distinguishes two types of replications. So replications in the narrow sense and in the wide sense. The former consists of checking for errors and computa computational discrepancies in the original study, and the latter investigates whether the results are sustained when using other data. Then we also have the definition by Hammamesh uh, from 2007 that really uh, caught on and resonated with a lot of researchers. Um, so Hammamesh proposes grouping replications into three categories. First, pure replications, that's like a push button type of analysis. That's basically the reanalysis of the same data set using the same model and the same estimation methods. Then second, statistical replication, and that is the use of alternative comparable data, different variable constructions, different use of statistical software, or different types of estimation methods that are being used, utilized. And then the third aspect of the Hammamesh uh, definition of replication is scientific replication that kind of uh, proposes to use alternative theoretical uh, or conceptual approaches. And then more recently, or not really more recently, actually, um, has been a uh, another definition by Clemens, um, who identifies four categories. Um, and he's very careful to kind of distinguish between replication and uh, robustness uh, tests as well. Um, and then finally, Hubbard, 2016, he identifies six different types of replications. So as you can see, there have been quite a few papers, and this is just a very selective list of papers. Um, so quite a few papers that really try to grapple with what the term replication means in the economic uh, context. Um, so, and you can see here from just the few studies that I've been highlighting that there's quite a bit of variation. So I've done a paper um, that was published in the um, American Economic Review um, in 2015, right? In fact, 2015 was the working paper version, 2017 was actually the, the published version, um, where we also grappled again with the term replication. And for the sake of our study, we decided to adopt a very broad definition uh, of replication and we operationalized replication as any study whose main purpose is to determine the validity of one or more empirical results from a previously published study. And this is the definition that I will be using going forward uh, in this talk. Okay, So again, this definition can be debated and discussed, but we felt it's quite a broad one, um, which is very uh, inclusive. So um, we need a little bit of background to why replication is something economists should be concerned with. Um, and we need to kind of highlight a few um, issues that are specific to economics and how they engage in the scientific uh, process. So what we can observe in economics and have observed really over the last um, 50 years or so is that there is an increased drive towards mathematization and quantification of economics. And I think this kind of 
tendency to become more technical in economics um, reflects certain aspirations that economists have because they really want to be considered hard scientists. You know, we talk about people like chemists, uh, physicists, medical scientists, and so on, you know, um, practicing natural sciences. The economists would like to uh, buddy up to these uh, scientists and be considered as equals uh, by these scientists. And um, and the availability of large data sets, um, increasing computing power, um, the um, you know ways of um, data storage, more electronic data storage, and easily usable um, statistical and econometric software, it made it more easier for economists to maybe kind of you know achieve these aspirations of pretending to be a natural or hard scientists. And these aspirations are, are kind of further inscribed by uh, core curricula that are taught at um, universities, largely US universities, to be frank, um, that emphasize econometric and mathematical skills rather than realism and policy implications. Um, so one could actually speak of an Americanization of economics. Um, that's really characterized by excessive use of mathematics, statistics, and is dominated by a limited range of institutions and individuals. And just as a note aside, the sort of drive towards more mathematical or statistical approaches to economics may actually put off a lot of people from studying economics. In particular, women are really put off by engaging in economics because of its perceived technical nature, you know. So, um, yes, which is a bit of a, a sad thing, but that's just a note, note aside. Um, so the question one should ask then, how scientific is economics uh, in fact? And I think this cartoon here uh, shows uh, quite clearly my view on, on economics and econometrics economet more specifically on, on, you know, how scientific I think uh, the, the, the kind of the science, uh, the economic science really is. <clears throat> but let me, let me kind of unpack this a bit. Um, so first of all, um, the practice of economics. You know, is it a science-free space? This is, I think, the question I'm posing. And there's actually a, there's a number of reasons why we can hypothesize this and believe that the practice of economics is, in fact, uh, in many cases, a science-free space. So what we see in economics is that studies and results are rarely replicated. And your replication is really an important part of the scientific research process. Um, secondly, in economics, we find that a lot of empirical tests are often indecisive. They're using broken statistical instruments. And there's a really interesting book by Zilia and McCloskey, published in 2008, that talks about the cult of statistical significance. OK, and of course, there are lots of controversies about p-values. And I think these controversies are not unique to economics. There are a lot of critics uh, in other academic disciplines that are also critical of p-values. So critics of p-values would often argue that their use encourages bad scientific practice, leading to the publication of far more false positives and false negative findings than the methodology would, would imply. And there's, in fact, a heated debate in various fields about the value of p-values. Uh, some journals go as far as banning the use of indicators for statistical significance or even any reports uh, of, of p-values. And there again, there's a really interesting paper on this by Guido Imbens from 2021 in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, who actually discusses this um, as well. So it's quite a lot of stuff going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then um, to continue with my concerns about the practice of economics and whether it is in fact a science-free space, there are also many economists that in fact acknowledge the limited capacity of their methods to provide conclusive evidence on important policy matters. And again, really interesting study by Lima published in the early 80s uh, about taking the con out of econometrics. And there are further studies, really, um, more recently, 2011 by Munsky, um, really interesting papers uh, Munsky has written, where he argues that scientific um, inquiry you know, involves scientific uncertainty, and this is important in principle and in practice. So economists, however, and other re uh, researchers commonly report findings with incredible certitude, you know, reporting point predictions and estimates, and in many circumstances, Monsky argues, this amounts to incredible belief and incredible certitude. So some really controversial, interesting uh, points um, he makes, but I think there's some truth uh, in the matter. 
And, you know, the, the limited, uh, limited capacity of, of methods economists use is not surprising to um, statisticians. So if you talk to a statistician, and again, there's a paper by Friedman from the early 90s, he says that I do not think that uh, regression can carry much of the burden in a causal argument, nor do regression equations by themselves give, give much, much help in controlling for confounding variables. So I think these are really some damning verdicts on, you know, the, the methods Methods that are often used by economists, and um, and you know the findings derived from these methods are being used to really uh, make some very serious um, policy recommendations, as we could see with the Rogert and, and Reinhardt case. Um, and this can sometimes be quite dangerous if these studies are not being replicated and taken at face value, given the limits of the methods, but also the sloppy uh, you know workflows uh, that can be uh, uncovered in many cases. So. Let's now move on to uh, replication in economics. Um, so as I said earlier already, uh, many uh, results that are presented in published economics papers are not reproducible or not generalizable to alternative empirical specifications, econometric procedures, extensions of the data, and other modifications to the original studies. So, and I'm relating this here to, you know, the Hamish uh, definition of replication, which is a bit broader. Um, so, and the concern um, that we have in economics uh, to do with replication is not restricted to economics and the social sciences, but actually that's connected to the hard sciences too. In fact, there's uh, you know quite a few articles in the popular media now concerned with replication. So a few years ago, um, and again and again, these popular media articles are flaring up regularly. You know, The Economist, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, BBC Radio, LA Times, they all kind of report on replication uh, issues or lack of replicability of scientific studies. But often what they do in the popular media is to focus on academic fraud. While I think the academic community is actually more concerned with the production of disproportionate rates of false positives. So, of course, replication may not be a panacea for all the problems we face around uh, very fine verifying scientific findings, but I think replication can uh, play a very useful role in checking um, the findings of published um, results, um, and it can maybe kind of contain the spread of incorrect results um, or kind of correct them should they be uh, out there in the public domain already. So, I mean, I've been a bit down on economics in terms of um, not engaging in replication, but Maybe that's not quite entirely accurate because I think on and off, they've always been economists concerned with replicability. So I've listed a very brief history of data sharing and replication in economics. So from the early days of applied economics, there has been some acknowledgement that it's very important to share data. So if you go back to the um, early 1930s, 1933, in fact, uh, the editor, Max Frisch, of a very well-known economics journal called Econometrica, he basically, and I cite him or quote him, uh, he basically says, in statistical and other numerical work presented in Econometrica, the original raw data will, as a rule, be published unless the volume is excessive. This is important in order to stimulate criticism, control, and further study. So you can see that Max Frisch has already realized the importance of data sharing uh, in order to get the academic debate going and also kind of check what's happening uh, and how accurate are these published findings are. So, however, despite these very early calls for data sharing and replication, the practice of replication by economists has been very uh, limited. Um, we observe that from the 1916 onwards, the Journal of Human Resources um, has actually included replication as part of their analysis. So they were really like the first movers uh, in that regard. And then in the mid-1970s, the Journal of Political Economy initiated a confirmations and contradictions section, which existed from the 1976 to 1999. And the Journal of Political Economy is one of the top, top journals, in fact, uh, in, um, in the economic sphere. So that's quite noteworthy, really, that they had something like confirmations and contradictions. And I'm not entirely sure why this section was, in fact, um, discontinued in 1999. Maybe it proved to be too controversial, because I'll come to that later 
data. Engaging in replication is not an easy thing to do because it can often lead to controversy, sometimes abusive behavior and other unpleasantness, which really puts um, people off from engaging in replication, especially younger researchers uh, may be really worried uh, for their reputation to um, engage in replication activities. <clears throat> So let's continue the brief history of data sharing. So I've managed to get up to the 1970s. So by the 1980s, um, there are a few major economics journals uh, that had actually data sharing or replication policies in place. Um, so a journal of money, uh, credit and banking, um, in fact, requested authors to submit data and code. And I think they were really the, 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 the first movers in that regard to really start enforcing the submission of data and code. Of course, you can have then a discussion on what sort of data should be submitted. Often it's just the estimation data rather than the raw data that's being submitted. And we all know that <clears throat> between raw data and estimation data, there are a lot of management processes taking place and cleaning processes that um, can lead to errors in subsequent analysis. So ideally, I think uh, raw data should really be shared. Um, and you know the code that explains how the raw data was transformed and cleaned uh, to move to the estimation data. So raw data, estimation data, and subsequent codes um, to explain the different transformations are really needed, I think, to fully comprehend uh, as to whether, um, uh, you know, the, the, the analysis of a published paper is robust or not. Anyway, so moving on from the 1980s, we've seen that subsequently an increasing number of journals, uh, American Economic Review, uh, Journal of Applied Economics, Econometrica, adopted data sharing and archiving uh, policies or sometimes replication policies, either requiring authors to provide data and code upon request or deposit their data and code in journal managed data archives. Uh, up of submission of their article. And I know for a fact that the American Economic Review, for example, um, has also um, a data editor that actually checks all the submitted data and code and see whether that actually works or not. But this is all just estimation data and the code that then replicates the uh, published findings uh, in the final uh, published paper, actually. Um, so, however, these um, data sharing, archiving and replication policies um, were often not um, sufficient. And in fact, a lot of these policies were just, you know, in place on the journal websites, but they were not always strictly enforced, which makes them kind of some, somewhat useless, uh, of course. <clears throat> so why, why do we need replication? So I kind of alluded to this earlier already, that we need replication for audit and transparency purposes, but there are four more uh, specific reasons really why I think we need um, replication. So first of all, there's something called harking or hypothesizing after the results are known. So this practice basically turns hypothesis testing uh, on its head with theories being developed only after empirical results have been obtained. And then the same empirical results are used to test these theories. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, I think we need replication to combat data mining and estimation manipulation, which is also commonly known as p-hacking, by which researchers literally torture the data until they are able to produce the elusive p-value. And again, I've talked about controversies around the p-value. And again, Zillia and McCloskey, when they write about um, the cult of statistical significance, they say the preoccupation with p-values uh, represents a corruption of the scientific process by which statistical significance, rather than economic importance, becomes the focus. So I feel they do have quite a point here. Um, and then third, uh, third reason uh, for why we need replication, of course, there are issues around data errors, but also outright fraud. So there is a popular website called Retraction Watch uh, that publishes a leaderboard that tracks researchers with the most re re retractions in academic um, journals. And well, and good news, if you can speak about good news in that context, um, only one economist actually makes the top 30 list in that regard. If you go to Retraction Watch, you find a lot of medical um, papers being um, retracted actually quite regularly. And I think the final reason really uh, for um, the need to replication is to deal with publication bias, uh, by which false positives are disproportionately reported uh, in the literature and thus, you know, exposing uh, potential type one uh, errors. So solution to these four issues really is replication uh, because it allows us to expose fragile or incorrect results um, by basically redoing the original data analysis 
allowing you to adjust model specifications or actually use different um, estimation methods as well. And as a result of this, you are exposing uh, potential type uh, one errors. OK, so um, yeah, hence that is, I think, important. OK, so now let's look a bit more at the frequency of replication studies published and in economics. Um, so as I said earlier, um, I've published this paper in the American Economic Review in 2017, uh, where we actually looked at the frequency of replication studies or the state of replication in economics. And I mentioned that earlier I used uh, we use in this paper, we used a very broad definition of replication, namely that replication is any study whose main purpose is to determine the validity of one or more empirical results from a previously uh, published study. So in this paper, we identified 188 replications that have been published in the top 50 economics journals since the late 1960s. So that by itself is not a massive number. We're talking about the last, what, 60 years or so, and we have like a 188 economic studies across the top, top 50 economics journals, okay? So that's not an awful lot. And you can see this illustrated quite nicely here on the graph on this slide. So while the number of replication studies have increased in frequency, again, especially from like, say, early 2000s onwards, but mostly from 2010s onwards, um, they are still relatively uncommon and have not really increased uh, in, in um, dramatically uh, in recent years. OK, we're still talking very low numbers. And in fact, in recent years, I've seen a slight drop again. So of the 188 replication studies that you can see listed here, um, Actually, more than half have been published in only five journals. OK, so out of these 50, only five really have um, are kind of the, the outlet for the <clears throat> large, for a large proportion of these uh, replication studies. And many of these five journals are very specialist um, journals. OK, and there are only 16 studies that have ever published more than three replication studies. So that gives you a pretty good idea on the state of replication in economics. And I think this lack of uh, publication outlet really creates a major disincentive, disincentive uh, to undertake um, replication research, um, especially in combination with um, additional obstacles. And I am going to talk about these obstacles or resistance to replication uh, on this slide now. And believe me, there's a lot of resistance um, to replication. So really, in the mid-1980s already, um, Deval, Thursby and Anderson actually identified a number of reasons why um, economists are quite reluctant to uh, engage in replication activities. Um, so really, I just highlight maybe the three main reasons for why economists are, are kind of, um, you know, re reluctant to engage in this or reluctant to undertake replication. So <laughs> replication research is usually not well regarded. Uh, it's commonly considered to be uh, derivative uh, and lacking in methodological and conceptual uh, novel novelty. So the reward in economics or in academia more broadly really is for innovation or novelty. OK, so replication doesn't really uh, fit the bill in this regard. Further, um, researchers who replicate uh, other scholars' research may be suspected of having distrustful and malevolent uh, motivations. Replication can generate feelings of abuse and bullying and persecution in both replicators and replicatees. And this creates an environment <clears throat> that inhibits sharing and uh, co collaboration. So, and again, I mentioned that earlier that especially young colleagues uh, may really um, be worried in engaging in replication activities, especially when it comes to replicating uh, very seminal papers that have been conducted by <clears throat> very well known uh, large economists. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, and um, the final point really explaining the res resistance to replication in economics is that. Um, and that's uh, based on a paper by Feigenbaum and Levy published in the early 90s. Um, they note that journalists may not actually want to publish replications because of a belief that they will not be cited as frequently as original research. So, for example, um, and that's a medical uh, reference here now, the editors of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is widely considered to be one of the top medical journals uh, in the world, uh, famously characterized researchers who use other researchers' data as research parasites. Um, so, and I think especially this last last point really uh, may explain uh, the lack of publication outlets and published replications. Um, so, yeah, nobody really wants to be characterized as a research parasite. And I think it's quite an unfair uh, characterization um, as well. <clears throat> so this lack of replication uh, outlets 
is really a, a big issue. And this is what you can see here really uh, on this table, on this slide as well, which again, as I alluded to earlier, shows that only about five, six journals have been uh, the outlet for, outlet for the majority of the 188 replication studies uh, that, that we have seen. So you can see here the Journal of Applied Econometrics, um, you know, so they've published 46 out of the 188 uh, replication studies, followed by the American Economic Review, Journal of Human Resources that have engaged in publishing replication since the 1960s and so on. So you can see that really it's a very uh, small number of uh, specialist journals that really have uh, published a disproportionate amount of all uh, replication studies that we've seen in economics over the last 60 odd years. So really, and this has to change, uh, really, that um, we see more um, outlets, publication outlets <clears throat> in economics for people to uh, publish replications. And we have actually seen various replication initiatives now coming to uh, the fore. So not just in economics, of course, but also in uh, other social sciences um, and beyond the social sciences as well. So let me maybe just highlight a few replication uh, initiatives to maybe kind of end on a slightly more positive note. It's all, it's not just all bleak in economics. It, economists may be particularly reluctant to engaging in replication, but I think there is change uh, underway to change that. Um, and I think increasingly um, younger economists are starting to engage in replication as well, as well, despite the worries that, you know, they, their career prospects may be slowed down or hampered by replicating um, very seminal economics papers. But maybe just to highlight some initiatives that are underway. So we have the Reproducibility Initiative by the Center for Open Science. Then we have the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency transparency in the social sciences. Um, in the political sciences, there's also a replication initiative by, uh, led by Gary King. Um, then we have a replication economics project at Göttingen University in Germany that's funded by the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, and in fact, there are some recent highlights, and that's maybe more linked to especially what's happening in psychology, but also in the political sciences. Um, so in psychology, there's an initiative that's been spearheaded <coughs> And that actually has also gained more traction in the political sciences, and that is that of registered replications. So concern that journals were biased against the publication of statistically insignificant results, social, the journal Social Psychology uh, put out a call for a special issue on replications, and they invited replication formats that included re registered um, replications that are described as authors uh, to submit the introduction, methods, and analysis plan for a replication study or studies. And these proposals will be reviewed for their importance and soundness. And once provisionally accepted, the results will be published without regard to the outcome, provided the authors complete the study as proposed. So I think that that's really quite um, a good idea. And related to that, the, the Journal of Perspective in Psychological Science uh, announced that a new article type called Registered Replication Reports would be a regular uh, feature in the journal. And the first was, in fact, published in 2014. And I think since then, the concept of accepting articles uh, based on importance of research, the research question, uh, quality of the research design, um, before the research results are in fact known, has in fact rapidly expanded to include um, a large number of journals in psychology, the political sciences, and also other uh, disciplines, including many of the top journals uh, in, in their respective fields. Um, though I have, having said that, there's, uh, to my knowledge, <laughs> there, there's no economics journal that has um, kind of um, adopted this uh, kind of pre-registration uh, format yet, okay? Um, so yes, so at the time of writing, um, 41 uh, journals have in fact adopted uh, the idea of registered reports, but no economics papers so far, sadly. Um, so yeah, and I think... Um, why I think that why do I think there is a change really in the air in economics when it comes to uh, replication? I think that's to do with the increasing availability of data and code. So a few years ago, my students would ask me, where do I find data and code? Um, and I was really struggling to provide them with an answer. Now the answer is a lot easier. There is the UK Data Archive, there's the Harvard Dataverse, there are lots of different outlets where data and code are in fact made available. Um, technological innovations um, in the allocation of journals 
space have also driven uh, replication and I think societal factors um, as well. You know, people want to know how much they can trust uh, research findings. You know, in a in an era of fake information, um, we all have to scrutinize what we read and digest in terms of information more carefully. So I think there are more people who really want to know how much can I trust uh, all the information that is being published, especially in the academic uh, sphere. So I think there's more appetite, I think, uh, for replication or reproducibility, whatever terminology you want to use. So um, kind of that's really my last two slides, and then I'm very happy to, to have um, a bit of Q&A and get some views from you. So in economics specifically, um, we have a few activities that have now been going on. I mentioned the replication economics wiki uh, that Göttingen University has been driving. Um, there's also the replication network that I initiated with a colleague, um, Bob Reed in New Zealand, uh, that reports on replication efforts uh, specifically in economics. And then I mentioned uh, that earlier, a lot of economics journals adopting data policies, AER in 2004 already, but They've recently updated their data policy and there are more and more journals now adopting data sharing, data archiving policies. Uh, and often when you submit a paper now, the question is asked, are you happy to submit data and code? And please note, uh, ahead of publication, you must submit data and code. So there's a lot more happening in the submission uh, process now as well as journals really driving uh, kind of or enforcing um, these data sharing and data archiving policies that they have. Um, there is a journal called the Journal of Comments and Replication Economics. So that's dedicated to publishing replications in economics. So that's some, some uh, excellent outlet uh, to go to as well. And then more recently, the Institute for Replication, I4R, um, has actually been established and they are aiming to improve uh, the credibility of science by systematically reproducing and replicating uh, research. And in fact, they worldwide they actually operate what's called the replication games and that's often a one-day event to connect researchers to collaborate on um, the replication of notable papers and in fact the UEA has the knowledge games uh, on the 10th of July and if any of you is interested to participate in the UEA knowledge replication games then there is a link here on this slide uh, that um, I'm happy to post this in the chat as well and share it later but there's a link here <coughs> allowing you to in fact register for the replication games at the UEA. So that should be quite an uh, exciting uh, undertaking. So you can see there's a lot more appetite now in economics in particular to really engage with this topic of um, replication. So maybe to wrap up, so given the um, economists' quest for scientificity, um, it's pretty surprising that replication is not yet a central element in the practice of economics because it's quite an integral element uh, in the scientific research process otherwise. Um, I think replication holds promise to clarify uh, the state of existing policy relevant knowledge and to build more robust methods uh, and analysis. And of course, replication is not an easy task. There are strong disincentives, and I kind of spelled out these various disincentives. Uh, it can lead to disputes and acrimony, so it's not always easy. Um, and it, it, show, it needs a certain robustness, maybe, on the part of the researcher to maybe replicate, um, in particular, noteworthy and seminal papers. But we need replications to test the correctness, correctness robustness, and also the generalizability of um, published um, findings. Uh, question is, um, despite all these advances in promoting replication in economics, um, why is the practice of economics still lagging behind uh, many other fields? So is that because the problems that plague other disciplines are less severe than economics? Or is it because uh, econ economics is more resistant uh, to replications? Um, but this is this is arguable. Um, but of course, it's very important to understand, um, you know, why economists are so reluctant. We need to understand it to be able to really scale up and institutionalize um, replication in the economics discipline. And I think I'll end here. Um, if you're interested in the Replication Network, um, here's just um, uh, the website replicationnetwork.com. So we try to stay on top of all the developments uh, in terms of replication economics. Uh, if you're an economist and you listen, you're very welcome to uh, sign up to the Replication Network as well, because it's great to have um, uh, basically a roster of um, like-minded uh, economists. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much um, for listening. And I think we've got plenty of time now for um, questions and answers and comments.
Yeah, thank you very much, Marin. That was very informative and insightful, even for me, who has no idea about economics. <laughs> so thanks very much. I think there is some uh, someone was typing a question in the chat. Meanwhile, I also have people in the in the room. So if anyone would like to ask anything, please do let me know. Meanwhile, I'll go ahead. <laughs> With the first one, so you said that economics is still lagging like, behind other sciences and disciplines, but is there anything in the context of uh, replication and reproducibility, is there anything that economics could be proud of? <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of things. <laughs> I may become a bit of a cynical person having engaged in this area for so long. Um, I think economists pride themselves, well, <laughs> many things. Um, yeah, I mean, the work I do, for example, I, I was very applied economics. Um, and I, I like to think that a lot of my work has um, shaped certain policy decisions, especially in low and middle income countries, uh, in terms of the effectiveness of certain um, programs. So I think economists do get it right. And they do some really interesting work. But I think they need to um, ensure that they are working in more transparent ways and, and just be less secretive. Because a lot of economists, then when I approach them, but the um, they'd be willing to share the data on a paper that I found very interesting, they are very reluctant to share the data. Or if they share the data, it's incomplete. And then when I ask for the code, they say, oh, I've lost the code. There are lots of excuses. And I think that's a bit of a shame that, that a lot of the economists seem to be quite distrustful of other economists trying to engage with, with their work. So I think that some of the attitude economists have uh, should change because I think they can be proud of all the work they're doing. Um, but they should really, um, you know, if they're serious about being scientists and seriously want to engage in the scientific process, they also need to adhere to the principles of the scientific process, and that includes replication and being transparent about what you do. And we, we live in an audit society in some ways, so I think we should we should allow scrutiny on, on what we do. So, um, yeah. Excellent. That was quite comprehensive. I think um, uh, Emma, uh, Emma, you, you raise your hand. Would you like to go ahead? Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, so it seems like replication is a way of sort of testing transparency. So transparency sits as, as a sort of a, a broader concept. I was wondering whether what you what role you think replication has in term in comparison to sort of other initiatives. So for example, um using I don't know what don't want to say a fake data set to do your analysis and then running it on the real thing or other initiatives like that. I, I wondered what what role you think replication has? Yes. <laughs> OK, interesting. <Sorry>. Question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, yeah, of course, um, for me, I mean, transparency and, and for audit purposes. But I think um, what you often find is this kind of push button replication, right? And that's kind of the Hummer definition of one part of it, right? That you kind of replicate existing analysis. And I think this is important, but it's kind of limiting. So I actually find it a lot more interesting if you um, go beyond this and actually um, maybe use data and um, subjective to different estimation techniques, different software, uh, because interestingly, whether you use R or Stutter and doing the same sort of um, economic metric technique, you may end up with slightly different results. And that could be to do with how the statistical software actually runs some of these estimations. So I think in order to make actually replication more novel and more interesting to maybe also journals and general readers is to kind of expand and go beyond the pure button type of replication or pure replication and kind of do something um, slightly different, you know, different theoretical framings maybe as well uh, and so on. So I think replication can play quite a big role um, beyond just purely replicating what's out there, but um, maybe testing and expanding on this as well. I'm not sure I really answered that question, but I tried. <laughs> It was a hard one. <laughs> Sorry. It was indeed. <laughs> I, I, can I, oh, if there are yeah. no other questions, can I ask another one? Yes, please. Um, so I was, I was wondering, so we've talked about the role of journals in sort of facilitating replications and sort of publishing them. I was wondering whether you could go to the start of sort of like the research pathway and look more at funders um, getting involved in replication sort of making it a part of their grant process where they require the researchers to do something at the end that makes it replicable because i think with the journals i mean i've, I've i'm trying to pu publish a paper at the moment with replicable code 
Mm. And it's a lot of work. Yes. So I can I can understand how people don't end up doing it because by the time you've written your manuscript, you're tired of the tired of it as it is, let alone actually getting it so that it's accessible to others. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And actually, increasingly, I think funders are catching on to this um, because they realize that journals have these data sharing, data archiving uh, policies and requiring submission of, of code, etc. I think funders realize that now. And I think increasingly funders, they ask you um, also to then um, submit your data and also often the code to the UK Data Archive, Harvard Dataverse or something like this, you know, so it's in the public domain. So I think the funders are slowly, slowly catching on to this as well. And I think that I had a recently a discussion with a colleague about this and at what point do actually funders then provide um, funding for doing this? Because as you said, it's very time consuming, right? It takes several days to write up your data and code so that it's actually usable by somebody, right? You need to read me file maybe for people to navigate all that, all, all the all the work you've done. Um, so, and you want to be paid for this sort of effort. So um, I, I don't think there are funders yet to actually uh, allocate time that they pay you for this time to actually um, kind of prepare data and code so that it can be shared. So at the moment is I think onto you to do this um, but I think slowly slowly I think they, they're waking up to the fact that they need to reward researchers to do this otherwise they're not going to do a, a proper job but I think we're still some way away from this but I think it's going in the right right direction and and, and but yeah on, on the on the business of it being time consuming um, for uh, making data and code available I mean I usually because I know at the end of writing the manuscript, you're so fed up, you don't just want to get rid of it and don't want to deal with it anymore. So I just do it as I go along because I know I have to make data and code available in one way or another um, because I'm, you know, I need to practice what I preach. So I just do it as I go along. I literally annotate everything and I start my readme file as I do the analysis because, I mean, just for my own sake, to be honest, because half the time I forget what I'm doing and I work on multiple data sets usually. Um, so I think it's we need to change our work habits maybe um, as well. And then it becomes less, less time consuming if you already start very early on in the research process to document everything extensively as well. But anyway, um, I think Tracy, Tracy is next now. There was a question. Yeah, there were. Emma's kind of raised my question, but um, I was kind of so uh, there's costs attached to replication. You've talked a lot about those in Emma's answer, but I wondered it's uh, more about the more intangible costs like career and things that you've talked about and what initiatives could happen, what would change people academic institutions approach to this and um help careers and otherwise so what what could be done to address yeah. costs that aren't financial yeah incentivizing people so for example at uea what we've been doing we have actually to the promotions handbook we've in fact um added an incentive that you know is part of the there are three parts to getting promoted you have to be great in your outputs uh, great in your teaching and great generally uh, in the research culture research environment area so we've added in the research culture environment area we basically added uh, something that says um, if you engage in replication practices and um you know make data and code etc available or generally engage in that area, area um, that is like a bonus a brownie point to basically get you um, promoted so we're trying to in a software softer way um, encourage and incentivize colleagues I think to engage in this um, not just um, because they have to because the journal or the funder requires it but also in order to maybe advance their careers get promoted and so on so I think more and more institutions in fact um, are now kind of um, looking into this of how they incentivize their own researchers to actually engage in this um, practice so, and I think UEA and others have tried to do this through the promotions process to encourage um, people to get involved in this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes, there is one in the room. Hi, uh, my name is Kyoko. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, sorry, I somehow I failed to log in the team, so I'm just uh, watching uh, the, the slide in, on the room here. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, thank you for your presentation. So replication is really interesting. And uh, my question is, uh, um, how researcher researcher will be, become confident to, as a worker, as a, as, a, as a researcher? I mean, for me, replication is really difficult, time consuming, but a very great opportunity to learn and become confident of, on my analysis itself. So without uh, uh, doing the replication, how we can um, grow up as a researcher. So that's it, really my basic question. So today's presentation is really helpful and I'm really interested in uh, replication. So, uh, uh, sorry, this is a long, but uh, the, 
how uh, researchers in the past researchers uh, get used to the get skilled to become more um, get the more uh, capability. That's my question. Okay. Yeah, good question. Um, well, I think, I mean, you're consuming research products and you have to ask critical questions at every stage of, of consuming or reading this research product. You yeah? ask yourself, do I believe the methodological approach the researchers have taken? Do I trust these findings in terms of internal validity, for example? So there are a range of questions I think you can uh, ask uh, and to assess the quality and the credibility uh, of a particular um, research product, a paper, a report or whatever it is. So I think that's short of replication, that's what people would do, right? Critically assess the quality of uh, something they are reading, asking the question of how much they're actually trusting it. But to fully and truly, I think, understand a paper, if, for example, you read something like what I did, Pitt and Kanka, the impact of microfinance in Bangladesh, that really got me into replication. I read this paper and it was heavy duty econometrics. And I just thought, this can't be right what they're doing. I do not believe what they're doing. I have a lot of questions around the econometric specifications. I have a lot of questions around the findings that are kind of contradicting other papers. And I thought, okay, to truly, truly understand this paper and to be able to really, truly understand the quality of that paper, I need to replicate it. So, and that's how I got started. And then I, I faced a lot of problems, um, the data and the code, of this particular paper were not made available. Um, the World Bank, it was a World Bank a data set that was used. The World Bank had very selectively made uh, some data files um, available uh, that did not fully allow me to comprehend uh, the findings of the paper. So it's a tricky business to fully verify um, uh, the, the credibility um, of a particular study. It's become a lot easier. When I did this, it was 15 years ago. So um, now it's become a lot easier to do this because of the availability of data and code. And I think if you do a, a pure push button replication and if you're interested in this I mean the Norwich the UEA replication games are on 10th of July where people basically do a lot of push button replication you get a paper that's been selected that's really interesting um, and then you check whether the data and code is available you run the data and uh, the code on the data see whether you can verify the published findings if not you ask certain questions and that's the only way to truly understand the quality uh, of a paper, I think. Um, but yeah, that's time consuming business sometimes. Not everybody has time for this. And in the absence of being able to do a replication, I think, yeah, ask ask critical questions of a paper, you know, can I trust it? Can I believe it? And so on. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, definitely, I'm really interested in the, the event you mentioned. So I, I try to um, participate for that. And I, I think I can get more better understanding. Thanks so much. Great. Great. Thank you. Right. More questions, comments, feedback? <laughs> right. Just remind, I'm recording the session. I will upload on YouTube and share the link on our Twitter account uh, in, in case you would like to watch it again, or I, I'm sure there will be more people outside of the A who would like to have it. Uh, as well. I would like to apologize to people in the room because <coughs> I had another meeting of teams in the background and they must have been disturbed by all these beeps and notification sounds, so sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Tracy, very kind of you. Um, yeah, if there are no questions, I'll wrap up. I'll thank Marilyn again once again. Very informative, very insightful. Thanks again. And um, and thanks everyone for coming and participating. Great, thank you. Thanks for organizing the event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.